Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome to the Property Couch podcast. And at this point, I normally say welcome to you, Ben. But of course, he isn't around at the moment. He's probably uh, putting a fishing line into a creek somewhere or just relaxing in the north of Western Australia. So of course, for the next few weeks, I've got some amazing co-hosts to join me. So I am going to welcome you, Julia Hartman, to the Property Couch. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you, Ben, for having a prize for having me along. Can we start there? Uh, he's fishing. He's, he's fishing, but uh, it's so exciting to have you on, Julia. We've had you before. You're a returning guest. You've been so gracious to be my co-host. And look, to be honest, the benchmark's not that high to, to beat with Ben. So he's a Collingwood supporter, and so therefore there's no need to be nervous. But um, I'm excited because as we move into tax season, that is your area of expertise. So not only are you going to co-host with me today, you're going to share your subject matter expertise on tax and in particular property tax, which is really exciting. But uh, I did mention you've been on before, uh, Julia, but I'm just going to give everyone a little background on you. You are the founder of the Band Tax Group, which is a national cooperative of tax accountants, which is a body of professionals who specialise in tax and property. You've also got a couple of books um, with the very, very wonderful Noel Whitaker, Saving Tax on Your Investment Property, Winning Property Tax Strategies, and rumour has it that you are writing another one as we speak. Is that true? We are, but it'll be a little while, I think, for us. Mm, all right. We'll make sure you come back to the property couch when that comes out. Uh, we'd love to support you and share that out with our community. But uh, I think the bottom line here is, Julia, that you are a specialist when it comes to property uh, tax. And we get a lot of people reach out to us on the podcast to say, hey, listen, I've got an accountant, but I really want someone who specializes in property because really the game here is to maximize the legal deductions that you can get as a property investor. And that's something that you've specialized in. We chatted before we recorded, but it, uh, it's, it's a good story to lean into. Why of all of the tax act that you could get exposed to, why is it that you like to specialize in property and property investors? Oh, well, I'd probably say I'd make more money out of property than I have out of working for a living, Bryce. So it's a personal interest, but I, I do cover other areas too. I'm interested in the whole lot. They don't spend it well enough, as the saying goes. I want to keep it. Wow. I don't earn dollars to ourselves. Yeah, well, we've got a lot to unpack. We are going, we're into tax season. We're going to talk a lot about tax. We've got some questions from our listeners. We've got some, some of the basics that people need to know. So we've got a really jam-packed episode to get into all right so we are going to start today with my mindset minute theme and of course we're in that tax space so i thought it would be remiss of me not to go into a couple of themes but i found a few here julia one is um this is from albert einstein as a quote the hardest thing in the world to understand is income tax that's one uh this one is from dennis healy the former chancellor of of the exchequer uh which is the treasury over there in the uk the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion is the thickness of a prison wall. So we might talk about the difference between those two shortly. And then this last one, which is a famous quote here in Australia, I pay whatever tax I am required to pay under the law, not a penny more, not a penny less. If anybody in this country doesn't minimise their tax, they want their heads red. Because as a government, I can tell you, you're not spending it that well, that we should be donating extra. And of course, that was the late, great Kerry Packer when he was being grilled, I think, in the Senate. Uh, I think that was back in the 90s. So, um, so of course, just setting up the theme for today that um, really what we want to do is help people avoid tax, but certainly not evade tax. Do you have, do you have many people get the, that, that wrong in your journey, <laughs> Julia? I think, I think the words minimise. I like my analogy is you take it right up to the wall. Yep. No further but you know where the wall is that you can take it to. And anyone that objects to that, I say, look, 
that's only dollars. If you, if you reduce the speed you travel in your car 10 kilometres below the speed limit, you probably save a life. Yeah. But nobody does that, do they? So. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, well, it really... The whole the whole crux of it is if you're a property investor you're not you're not actually buying the property because of the tax but if you have bought a property and everything else stacks up you then have to double down to make sure that you can get everything that you can possibly legally get so you can maximize tax refund and or tax payable if you're in a business scenario so that you can actually um afford it afford it and cash flow it better now um, I don't often say this, but I'm, I'm excited about this discussion because I used to be an accountant, Julia, back in the old days. I, I'm a degree qualified accountant, but I didn't stick it out anywhere near as long as I should have to um, to qualify myself as an accountant. But um, I'm excited. I love the numbers. I love the the sense of um, working out maximum deductions so that we can cash flow and obviously build some wealth through property. Now, just so that we can get a little bit to know you a bit better here, Julia, can you take us back to when you were growing up? Um, what was the money discussion like across the dinner table for you? Oh, right. Well, it's money. It's in the Hartman DNA. I think my, uh, my my father thought his father was stingy. I thought my father was stingy, and I'm sure my son thinks I'm stingy. We believe <laughs> you count the pennies, look after them, and the, the pounds will look after themselves. What was it? Did, did, did your parents, you said your dad was stingy, did 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 you did you did you talk about it over the dinner table, or was it just a topic that wasn't discussed? Well, not as we do now, because people weren't. Um, remember, I'm considering my age. My dad's long gone. People weren't. Um, what's the word where you call savvy investors or stuff like mm, that? Mm. they they these are kids that grew up in the depression. Their idea was to get their debt paid off as soon mm. as possible. Because mm. my generation, when inflation hit, which is something to bear in mind now, that you realise that as soon as you um, borrowed money in the, in a year, what you borrowed seems insignificant, you know. And if you didn't borrow you were going to be left behind the eight ball. So there was a whole mindset change. And that used to challenge my father. He used to say, don't get this. He said, it's always been all my life, 3% on your money when you put it in the bank and 5% when you borrow it. Mm -hmm. And he also couldn't handle the, the fact that land started to cost more than houses. That made no sense. He says, land costs nothing. How can it cost more than houses? Yeah, so, yeah he did think about it, but it was a different mindset back then. So how did you how did you transition from that? If if he wasn't into borrowing, and then clearly you you're a property investor yourself, you've advised property investors over your professional career. Was there a paradigm shift that took a little time for you to adjust, or was it straightforward for embracing debt, productive debt? Yeah, well, um, I think the whole inflation thing was there when I was maybe in my late teens, early twenties. It was clear to see. After all, I I was an accountant. I, I noticed those sorts of things. So yes, there was a very different mindset that, no, I didn't have any problem adjusting to that. But probably if it hadn't been for an awareness of the importance of, you know, money is important and it's about your future and it's about having control over your life, I wouldn't have been as interested. So I think I think that's more the case. And, mm. and then you just, I mean, it was obvious to see every year my pay would go up 10%. That's right. I can remember as a kid, I had $100. I put it in the bank. And it gave me ten dollars a year interest, and that was enough to buy everyone's Christmas presents with. Mm. So no, I was born that way. I was just played Monopoly, just born that way. Yeah, you're a numbers person. You're clearly you're clearly uh, one of the go-to accountants in this country when it comes to property because you've made it a career to understand the real details of what property investors can deduct, and you haven't been afraid to challenge the tax office, have you? When you didn't agree with some of the um, What's the word? The mismatch of, of messaging around different deductions across across what you could claim. So you've had a few sort of robust discussions with the tax office over your journey, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. But don't yeah, they're all human like us, and you'll get you've got to get up the, the tree to get to mm. someone that really understands in depth. So I, I do enjoy a good argument, for us, So yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll see how that serves us in the next half an hour or so. But um. Look, I guess you now spend your time with a group of accountants that you meet regularly. Um, you are a co-op, so you have the Bantax group and you have a, a, a group of accountants across the country that that wear your, your branding, your shingle that says that you're part of the co-op. And 
I guess one of the, the benefits you have from that is that you get together on a regular basis and you thrash out um, scenarios that come to people across different borderlines, across different tax regimes all around the country. Um, so how do you think that served you over the last sort of 10, 20 years to, um, to stay sharper with everything with, with property? Well, I just love it because it's like a brain's trust. You know, we all bring different things to the table. Um, at one stage, we were studying the whole concept of what name to buy a property. And, and it's it's a complex issue at certain levels. And mm. um, this is, you know, they're going to do development and oh, just some of the things we come up with because we're a national group. So you've got different land tax and different stamp duty rules in different states, all sorts of games to play. Um there's so many things that it takes a lifetime to acquire that we one person can't know it all. And this brain's trust we have every Monday morning is just fun for me, I'm afraid. I get really excited about it. Oh, yes, such good stuff. Keep it going. Well, it's the relationships and it's the opportunity to, to, as you say, have that brain's trust to brainstorm what's necessary. Look, to be honest, we've just recently got our own property tax um, division within our own company. We were... Very excited to, to become a part of your group for that reason, because we want to be elite at helping clients claim every legal deduction that they can and to be able to brainstorm with other people who are talking this across certain boundaries. I'll talk a bit more about that later, but um, it's certainly an exciting part of our, our journey in our business to serve our clients, to make sure that they get every allowable deduction that they can. But um Kind of want to step into so, so the so what we've got uh, folks as a um, as a setup for today is Julia and I are going to riff it around some of the details that everybody needs to know as a property investor. Then we're going to go into a few little commonly asked questions that we all often get on the podcast and through our business. And Julia's been experienced too. And then towards the end of the podcast, we've got a couple of our listener questions, and they've asked some great questions that we're going to contribute to this episode as well. So we've got a lot planned um, heaps of content there'll be something in it for everyone so stick around folks till the end and you get to hear those questions from our listeners but um, let's kick it off with the basics here Julia when it comes to rental expenses there's three broad categories that people can put the expenses in to determine their deductibility Uh, the first one is those expenses that you just cannot claim and we'll talk about that in a sec The second category are the expenses that you can claim an immediate deduction in the income year that you incur the expense. And then there's a third category, which is where you can claim deductions over a number of income years. So I wanted to dive in on a couple of these just to to unpack your knowledge and your expertise. But um, some of the ones that you cannot claim, the biggest one, I guess the headline one, I've got a few here that we'll talk about shortly, but the biggest one is travel. There's been some change with travel recently. So let's kick it off with that because there once was a time when I got a property in Queensland, I live in Victoria, I could go up to Queensland on a tax deductible trip to actually inspect my property. But the problem with that is it got abused, didn't it? There was laws there in place, Bryce. It didn't need to be taken away as far as it did. You kept the diary, you apportioned the travel between when it was relevant to the rental property. And, you know, the worst case scenario of getting getting abused is you had a good dinner the night you went and met up, did your property inspection. I, I don't see that as a reason to cut it out completely. And remember, they didn't cut it out for the big end of town. They only cut it out for the mums and dads. Big end of town could still abuse it, so no, it was just a, it was just a grab and beat up the uh, little taxpayer because they can't afford to defend themselves. So it it, it does it, it's a challenge, right? Because there is legitimate um, claims for the majority of people. Now I do know, you know, having been in this industry now for over twenty years, that there were people that were really pushing the edge on that. They would, you know, suggest that you fly in on a Thursday night, meet the property manager on a Friday and then follow it up on the Monday to see how it went over the weekend and really stretch the bounds of, of the deduction. Um, but, but to be honest, I, I, you know, I've got to go to Queensland, I've got to go to you know, WA to see these properties. So it really has disadvantaged the investor that was actually doing the right thing, right? And, yeah, at what cost? What little saving did they have? And now what happens if you, when you do have to go and repair your property? You know, all these costs that aren't tax deductible that are real costs of owning a property. Mm, mm. It's not fair. They're taxing money that you haven't got. Yeah, exactly. So, so 
the category of expenses that you cannot claim deductions include acquisition and disposal costs of the property. Um, expenses not incurred by you, um, for example, the electricity bill for your tenant. Expenses incurred where your property was not generally available for rent. Expenses that are not related to the rental of a property, e.g. a personal use of a holiday home. Um, costs associated with maintaining non-income producing property that's used as collateral. Um, and expenses related to holding vacant land. There's a couple there that are interesting um, that in the past, Julia, people have wanted to claim if you are securing against some land in your portfolio that, that the land should be deductible or, of course, you know, the other one is your principal place of residence. You know, it's actually being used as collateral to buy investment properties. People are really keen to try and push the envelope, but it's really clear, isn't it? You, you just can't do it. It's got to be a direct nexus um, cost of earning income. It's not a cost of earning income. It just secures the loan. It's not that property is not producing any income for you. Now, seminars and courses are another one, but you've got a little you've got a little tweak to that, haven't you? Where you may be able to claim the cost for seminars and courses. Yeah, they went through. I don't know whether you're um, old enough to remember Henry Kay. I am. I only look young. I've got some vintage on my birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> He um, he gave um, investment courses a bad name. He really did. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a test case around his stuff. And um, they allowed the expense in regard to the portion of the course that trained the students to either increase their rent or reduce their expenses mm -hmm. of properties they already owned. So it was all about related to the income producing purpose. Mm -hmm. But yes, those properties that say, well, we'll show you how to buy the right property and all that sort of stuff. You're not going to get a deduction for them because they're on capital account and no, they don't go on the cost base of the property because they're incurred at a point too soon to be related yeah. to the property. So those new to, to property, the cost base is important for capital gains tax calculations. Can you give us a 101 on why that's important? Well, when you sell the property, you're going to be up for tax on it. So you've got to be able to measure how much gain you've really made. So that's where your acquisition and disposal costs go in, where your legal costs, your stamp duties to buy, and anything basically that you can't claim a deduction for, mm -hmm. put it in the box for um, capital gains tax. So you, if you increase your cost base, it means the calculation of how much capital gains tax that you pay gets reduced as well. So it's important to have good records. Now, the first one I mentioned was the acquisition and disposal costs of the property. So stamp duty, buyer's agency fees are two that um, obvious ones. That, that is incurred before you're in a position to um, incur rent. But what about in Canberra, for example, where you're, you're not actually getting the freehold, you're getting the leasehold? There's some sort of um, exceptions there, Rob? Yes, they get to write off their stamp duty cost immediately, but I think there's been some changes down there now where they're not going to have a big upfront stamp duty. They're going to have some sort of annual stamp duty. So I remember thinking, oh, that's not so relevant anymore. Yeah. That's something I read. We have a Canberra office that I must ask her, how's that, how's that going? Well, the thing is, one of the common questions we get in our business is, are the buyer's agency fees tax deductible? And the answer is no. They're a capital item. Um, but in Canberra, there is a case to talk to your accountant about whether or not they are deductible, given that it's a leasehold arrangement um, versus capital. So it's um, certainly not pretending neither of us are giving um, advice on this podcast today. It's just general in nature, but it's, it's worth asking the question of your accountant um, if you're based in Canberra. So you're, you're giving me a, a strange look, not, not, not agreeing with that? It used to me that the buyer's agent fee would be um, considered stamp duty, yes, because it's on a lease. I get your point that you're saying that the buyer's agent has only gone and stitched up a lease for you. Mm, exactly. Well, the thing is that um, the conditions in Canberra make it very favourable for being a a owner occupier. Anyway, there's, there's there's investors in Canberra. There's no doubt about it. But um, their land tax kicks in very very early from from the first dollar. So it's um, Largely uh, the domain when I've done uh, a lot of conversations with agents in Canberra, it's largely the domain of the owner occupier, but I'm not saying there's no investors there as well. So that's the first category, uh, those from which you cannot claim a deduction. The second category, Julia, is where you can claim an immediate deduction in the income year that you incurred the expense. Now, there's 
there's a list that I'm going to quickly rattle off just for the purpose of giving information for, for this podcast um, that you and I prepared prior. But then I want to lean into you on a couple of these, um, which require a bit of a special mention. But it includes advertising for tenant, bank charges, body corporate fees and charges, cleaning, council rates, electricity and gas, garden and lawn mowing, uh, insurance, including building contents and public liability, interest on your loans, any land tax, lease document uh, expenses, legal expenses, mortgage discharge expenses, pest control, property agents fees, quantity surveyors fees, uh, uh, repairs and maintenance, uh, bookkeeping fees, servicing costs, for example, to service a, a water heater, stationary and postage, telephone calls, tax related expenses and water charges. So that's a list as per given from the Australian Taxation Office. But um, there's a couple here that we wanna lean in on. The first one is body corporate fees and charges. Are they all deductible, Julia, or are there some exceptions? Even if the body corporate sinking fund goes and spends some money on improving the, the complex, they still you're still going to get a deduct, deduction for your body corporate fees. But if they introduce a special levy mm -hmm. to improve the complex, then you're not going to get a deduction because it's an improvement. You put that in your capital gains tax box. Mm. How often do you see people not be aware of that particular one, Julia, when you're preparing their returns? Well, yeah, they wouldn't be aware of it, but um, more the other way, tax office auditors, you know, my favourite people, like I like an argument, they'll turn <laughs> around and say, all special levies, no, no deduction for them. And that's not correct. It, then if it's a special levy, you have to look at the purpose of the levy. And as long as it's still qualifies as a repair and not an improvement, you still get a deduction for the special levy. If you look on the tax officer's website and what the auditors follow, they just go special levy, no deduction, but that's not true. So it's all it's all applying your repairs and maintenance rules that you have as to whether it's an improvement or not. And that's important, right? Because if you if you do just have a blanket rule not to use it and you are able to qualify for it or you've outlaid the cost, it's important that you can get at least the 30 cents back in the dollar um, or more um, for, for the expense. So that's important to have a specialist. Hey, I'll flag interest on loans. I don't want to dive into it too much here because we've got a question, a listener question coming up later in the show um, that covers this. But let's just say interest on loans is probably one of those um, uh, one of those areas that people want to dive into a lot. And um, so we, we will cover that shortly. What about the other one that comes up a lot, um, the difference between repairs and maintenance? That, that's, that's a big grey one, isn't it? Well, that's basically the, the test that you have to apply to these special levies. Um, so repairs and maintenance breaks down into, did you replace it in its entirety? If you did, you, you didn't repair it. Mm -hmm. So then you've got to look at it and say, well, it gets depreciated. Um, now, examples of that is a you've got to look at what the entirety is. So the roof on a house, if you replace the roof completely, not the entirety because the walls hold that roof up, mm -hmm. that's the entirety. Um, fence around a, a yard, you could replace it bits and pieces at the time and eventually end up with a whole new fence. But as long as you just did it a bit at a time, you didn't replace the entirety, so you get a repair. And if that fence was falling down when you bought the property, then repairing the fence is actually an improvement because you're only allowed to repair up to the stage it was at when you bought the property. Mm. Otherwise, it's an improvement beyond that. You can see how you can get yourself into trouble, right? Because you kind of think, well, the damn thing's falling over. I just want to, I just want to replace it, right? So that it's just functional. Uh, it's not, it's not as if you've changed it from any particular material. You just got it back standing, and you're saying that's going to be depreciated rather than than expensed. What about if you, what about if you're, you know, it comes down to even paint as well, isn't it? If you are repairing it, and you patch it up. Uh, with some with the same color paint, you're right. But if you change the color of the paint, that's an improvement. So it it, it kind of it, it it's it's super gray. And I mean, it's it it just goes to show that it's case by case, and you need someone to really look under the bonnet on on each and every item that you're you, you're trying to claim. Well, it depends why you're painting it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so and uh, you know if if the tenant that's your tenant came and put a hole in the wall, and that's why it needed painting. Doesn't matter if you've only owned the property two months your tenant happened on your watch then the repainting's fine um but yeah if you just bought it and you thought oh this is going to look so much better in a, a different color hmm. then it's an improvement but if 
uh, it eventually needs painting after you've had it for years and years um, and you pick a different colour this time, not a problem. Mm, okay. Because it's just, you know, still needed doing. It's a repair. So as I said at the top, it's it's not you're not investing for tax reasons, but once you've invested, you you you're trying to maximise what you can, and really that's what we're talking about here today. So first category was the expenses that you cannot claim a deduction. The second category was expenses that you can claim an immediate deduction in the income year that you incur it, and then the third category is where you can claim deductions, but not straight away over a number of years. And, and the typical ones here are are borrowing expenses and, and depreciation. So um, for borrowing expenses, correct me if I'm wrong here, Julia, but there's, t- there's two ways to look at it. One, you set up the, you buy the property, you've got some borrowing expenses and then you need to amortise it over five years. Um, and sometimes it's it's really six years, isn't it? Because it's, it's a pro rata in the first year and a pro rata in the sixth year and then four years with the four in between. But what about if you, what about if you change, if you refinance the property and you get some costs to move. Is it true that the costs to move are expensed in the year that you did it and then the new loan has to be amortised over five years? Yeah, so it's um, over the term of the loan all five years. Mm -hmm. So if you refinance at four years, you can write off the rest of the unwritten off costs for that loan in that year. And then in the new loan, you start that, the cost of establishing that loan over five years. Oh, very good. All right, so there you go, folks. Um, there's your three categories. Have a think about that from, from your own perspective. Those you can, those you can't. And of those you can, you can do it straight away or you can do it over multiple years. So they're your general categories. So uh, now clearly there's other things to, um, to con- other taxes that you need to consider rather than just negative gearing through income tax here. Capital gains tax and also GST in some cases if you're a developer or you are subject to GST. For most residential property investors, GST isn't something that where they're charging it on the rent. Um, they'll obviously pay GST to some of their service providers. But to what extent do most property investors need to concern themselves with GST, Julia? Well, they need to make sure that when they buy the property about the GST clauses in the contract. Now, an example of this was um, a client of well, she wasn't a client of mine when she did it. She was a client of mine when she found out what she'd done. She went to an auction down in Sydney and bought a residential property that had been used by a chiropractor as um, their place of business. And this chiropractor put a going concern clause in the contract, which means by agreeing to the going concern clause, she bought an auction, she just signed what was put in front of her. All residential sale contracts are the same, aren't they? Sure as egg, she'd agreed by that. Um, to register for GST and um, use it in a business. Mm. And the minute she decided to use it as her home, well, then she had to pay back the notional GST that had been saved by the going concern clause. So this was a long time ago. Fortunately for her, the property was only 500000 that she bought. Mm. She then had to pay the tax office another $50,000 because she signed to save um, the GST. The contract which said going concern calls so they need to be concerned at that point in time they need to get their account to look at these contracts in fact i'm working with solicitors at the moment to try and get something where we can get people online to do it um, to make sure it's done before you go signing before you go to an auction you know like 24 hour turnaround um, the next problem is if you build the house and you as a rental and you sell it after holding it for less than five years, there's a risk that the tax office will come along later and ping you for GST. And that problem is that if they're successful in pinging you for GST, it may be too late to put a margin scheme clause in the contract, which means you pay a lot more GST than if you had put that in the contract in the first place. Okay. Quite often we're saying to someone, get a solicitor to check this right so they can flag that. But you're, but you're saying if, if in doubt... Get your accountant to have a look at the uh, the clause to make um, with with reference to specifically GST, so that you don't get stung. Yeah, or a solicitor that's au fait with this um, mm. with the GST laws. In the case of this uh, client um, that bought this chiropractic premises, she used a conveyancing firm, and they were alert enough to say, "You need to talk to an account." Mm. They that's, they couldn't answer it, but you need to talk to an accountant about it. The trouble was with an auction, it was all too late anyway. It didn't mm. matter. 
Wow. Yeah, exactly. You got no, uh, you got no cooling off there. So I guess there's a lesson in it for folks listening to this is that the GST is important because the 50,000 you talked about before was roughly 10%, right? So if you don't get it right, um, that is the penalty, the financial penalty that might be coming your way. So it's significant. So it's, it's important that you get someone rep it all. So that's um, GST. CGT is clearly capital gains tax. Um, there is a significant date uh, for this, Julia, uh, 1985, is that right? When capital gains tax yeah. came in, it was Paul Keating back in the day uh, in the Hawke government era. Um, so prior to that, if you own a property that was prior to nine, built prior to 1985, oh, hang on, have I got it right? You owned it before 1985 or built nine, one of those two, you can help me out. It's capital gains tax free. Purchase. Purchase. So it's capital gains tax free. Can you explain that a bit more? Well, it's, 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 watch. <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's it's a grandfathered, cool. really, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that's it. You keep that property as long as you can. Sell off other properties, you keep that <laughs> as long as you can. Um, until you die, yeah. no matter what it go, goes up in value, it's never um, going to attract capital gains tax. But if it was vacant man, you build a house on it or you spent a lot of money renovating a house on it, then you're going to have two separate assets. The house would still be subject to capital gains tax, but it's normally the land that goes up in value anyway. So yeah, very, very valuable. Some of our uh, younger listeners w- would have thought that was a bonanza. Some of our older listeners may be in that situation, Julia, where that is something that they did prior prior to 85. I was in grade five back in 1985, so that was a long time ago. So there's your two other taxes to consider. So folks, that's the bit for everyone to know um, when it comes to expenses. There's a fair bit, you know, we're talking basic here of um, um, buying and earning rental accommodation, but there's so many things. There's commercial, there's industrial, there's developing, there's the margin scheme. There's a whole bunch of things that we're not going to go into in too much depth here. Um, but it is, it is complex and it's something that Julia and her team, uh, and now by extension our team, it is well and truly across, which is exciting. Now, the next thing I want to chat to you about, Julia, is some common questions that we get um, within the business, with on the podcast, people writing in similar questions. And the first one is transferring titles between spouses. Sometimes you might have come together in a relationship or you bought a property in a different name and you need to change it over time. Typically, it triggers... Um, stamp duty, and in some cases, capital gains tax. So that's a question we get a lot. How do you how do you navigate transferring titles between spouses? Well, your first problem to get any tax consequences of it. See, Part 4A says the tax office can void any transaction that's dominant purpose was a tax benefit. So you can do all the transferring, you like pay all the stamp duty, but they'll go still taxing it in the original owner's hands because they'll say, well, why did you do it? What was your, other than the tax advantage? Now, we've had a few rulings that we've put through and successfully where they've argued they did it to save their marriage, so to speak, that one of them wanted to sell it and the other one didn't. So one of them said they wanted to pay down the loan. So one said, well, look, I'm going to borrow this money, buy your half off you, you can pay it off the housing loan. It's all much of a muchness. We're married anyway, but you'll feel safer knowing the home loan is paid off Mm -hmm. and yeah the tax office has worn that on occasions with the the dominant not the dominant purpose not being a tax benefit of transferring but you've also got to think some people think they're though I don't think you have it down in Melbourne anymore think they're smart by saying to the stamp duties office oh it's a gift to my spouse so um, no stamp duty oh so the spouse receives this property as a gift well the loan to buy it's no longer tax deductible is it it actually didn't finance the source of income it financed the gift so Mm. you've got to consider that um or even if the loan you can't just say oh well whoever i'm transferring it for to now has to pay the loan you've got they've got to borrow to buy off you and it's fraught with danger And it's going to trigger capital gains tax at that point anyway. So you've got to start wondering, is it worth the cost? Um, They'd have to have a long time that they're going to be taxed a lot of money to make it all worthwhile, I think. Okay. And this is where buying properties and super funds avoids that consequence, but there's lots of other points. But it does cover you. Once it does become positively geared, it's only going to get taxed at 15 cents in the dollar. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and then, but then you've got um, capital gains, tax exemption um, ch- changes and all those sorts of things. So it's, you need to weigh it up, the, the pros and the cons, right? 
Yes. Oh, yes. And your age makes a big difference too. Hey, the other, the other common one we get, Julia, is the switch. We call it the switcheroo, where someone has a principal place of residence, they want to turn it into an investment property, or they've got an investment property, they want to turn it into a principal place of residence. Um, it's, it's important, isn't it? There's, there's, a, there's a number of things that are important here, but um, how often do you come across, you know, people wanting to do the switcheroo? Um, yeah, no, people do that all the time. In fact, I reckon a lot of property investors only acquire properties because they've moved for their job and they haven't sold the old one, you know. Mm, so, mm, mm. yeah, no, that sort of switcheroo comes around quite a bit. So um, it's a matter of being very careful with the loans because if you borrow to buy a new property to live in, then you're not going to get a tax deduction for that borrowing. And if you've almost paid off your other home, there's not much of interest you're going to claim against the rent. So for the average person that's almost paid down their original home, it becomes not worth keeping. You really can't afford to service a huge loan on the next property, whether it be in a new location or they've just gone to a better house. Because by the time they've saved up enough equity to get that better house, it's a hell of a debt for the better house with very little debt and all this rental income um, can be done. Um, also, what happens is they might have used, you know, the, the theory of put your wages in the loan and then draw down to pay a credit card or whatever, to cover your living expenses. Well, that churns a loan. So every time you draw down, if it's not in an offset account, but it's in a redraw facility or it's a line of credit, every time you draw down, you're borrowing for private purposes. Over about five years, that loan becomes basically um, all borrowing for your food, your bank card bill, you know, that sort of stuff, not for the original property you bought in the first place. It's called polluting the loan, isn't it? So, and it's, and it's a very innocent mistake that people can make just from what you just described. You've, you've turned the, the, the purpose of the loan from purchasing it to buy the house to purchasing it for the can of baked beans and the, 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 the tomato sauce. So, Really, really important that you don't get this wrong. Now, anyone who's been listening to our podcast for any length of time, we've we've been talking about this for a long time. The difference between an offset and a redraw account is enormous because you do not pay the loan off you uh, under an offset account, whereas the redraw, you're doing what you've just described, where you are changing the nature of the loan, fluctuating daily, weekly, monthly, depending on what you do. So we hope that the podcast can play a role in the switcheroo because bringing it to people's you know, front of mind that if you do adopt the offset strategy that I do, that Ben does, that we're teaching our community to do, it does give you that enormous flexibility. It's like having buckets of money sitting against your home where you're filling up these buckets to ultimately equal out the amount of debt that you have, but the debt still remains unchanged. Because if you have adopted that textbook like then you can go and buy another principal place of residence and move the offset money against that principal place of residence and without any um, cash flow disadvantage to you because you haven't changed the nature of the loan, it's still for the property, the purpose is now changed. So that loan now become the interest on the loan now becomes deductible if you've done that right, Julia. Yeah. That's correct, isn't it? So so what about if you what about if it's an investment property? Go on. No, I just realised this is audio, isn't it? So my nodding the head wasn't very helpful. Oh, no, <laughs> I said, no, yes, couldn't no. have said it better than what you said, Bryce. That's why I didn't comment. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so, so what about the other way? It's been an investment property for a long time and then all of a sudden you go, wow, I want to move into it. What are some of the things that people need to, to keep in mind to understand the value of the property at the time that they moved in and what's some other key things that they should keep in mind if that's the case? It was the other way around. It's investment property first. Now I want to make it my principal place of residence. And that is another beauty of the offset account. So now you just move the offset account from where you were living over to the house you're about to move into so that there's no interest. So they're just so flexible. Mm. But your problem is this property is probably always going to be exposed to capital gains tax. So unless it was your home originally, and you only rented it out for six years and you're moving back in, you might get away with um, covering it with your main residence exemption all the way through. But odds are you're going to have a capital gains tax bill unless you manage to die there because your heirs inherited market value at the date of death if it's your home at that time. So going back to the scenario of you haven't been able to cover it with your main residence exemption until you moved into it and um, 
one day when you sell, you're going to have to pay capital gains tax on it. There's no point in getting a market value when you move in because that's not how it works. It's just a pro rata over the whole, whole time you owned it. So think about pro rata. So, so same amount of years as a rental property and then same amount of years as your um, main residence. So half the time you owned it, it was covered by your main residence exemption. So half of the capital gain is taxable and then you get your 50% discount on that. But how do we calculate this capital gain? So you calculate the whole capital gain first and then you start reducing it. And costs that you have not been able to claim as a tax deduction that are associated with holding the property can increase that cost base we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So obviously the costs like rates and insurance and interest and that what's rented you claim as a tax deduction. So that doesn't count. But the cost while you're living there, you haven't claimed a tax deduction for. So as long as you brought that property after the 20th of August 1991, you are allowed to increase the cost base by your rates, your insurance, your interest, any improvements, any repairs, any maintenance. Here's the key word, maintenance. So that means that when you go to Woolies and buy some cleaning materials, when you go and buy some lawnmower fuel, etc., everything to do with maintenance. This is a huge record keeping advantage. And so while you won't get all of, you know, the dollar you spend on fuel will incre decrease the capital gain by a dollar, but then you say, well, half the time it was my main residence and half the time it wasn't. So you're only going to get 50 cents of that dollar to reduce your capital gain. But nevertheless, it's while you were living there that's mm. actually proportionally reducing the gain while you were not. Mm. So record keeping. The, the value of record keeping is enormous. So let's let's just underline that. Um, so for those of you that are not detail oriented, you can see it could cost you a little bit of money. So find someone uh, around you who is detail oriented to help you. So that's the the, the changing uh, transfer titles between spouses, uh, the switcheroo strategy. What about um, just some of the, the 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 differences that happen between uh, co-owners of property? So. You got two broad categories: joint tenants, which is typically speaking, you see in a relationship where the rule of survivorship applies. So I'm married to my wife. We have a house. Well, no, actually, she owns the house. But let's assume that we we have the house together. Um, if uh, if I was to pass, she would get it by default and vice versa. Whereas when it's a tenants in common, it's 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 a business relationship. So you still could have husband and wife or partner and partner um, having. 50-50 tenants in common, but on that example, if they were to pass, they don't automatically get the person's share. They The person can will it to someone else, right? Yes, and that um, that little trick that I mentioned about when you die um, and you're living there, your heirs inherited at market value at date of death, that won't apply. That's the other downside. So say we've had this, we've moved into the rental property, and mum and dad own it as joint tenants, and dad dies, then mum inherits it, his cost base and his capital gains tax liability. Mm. So if they've done this, they really need to change the title to tenants in common so that when dad dies, at least all the capital gains tax bill that was on his side of the ledger is forgiven and forgotten, and she inherits to another asset that he's half of the... The, um, the house at market value at the date of his death. Whereas if it was joint tenant, she'd get it as the survivor, not inherited. So that section can't apply. Oh, okay. That's a, that's Does something that I have. Sense? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't thought about that before. So that's, that's, that's interesting, right? So another, another way to look at it. So how many times have you seen the, the, the ownership percentage being sort of swayed up in the nineties and the 95s and fives, just to have the highest percentage in, in the, highest taxable earners' hands. Um, I'm sure you see that a lot, but have you seen any sort of pitfalls that come from that or is that just a smart tax strategy to um, to help folks put, put the ownership in the hands of the person who's going to get the most cash flow benefit? Yeah, no, I, I would rather see the 99-1 than the all-in-one-person's name for quite a long list of reasons, such as protecting the other owner. Then if they're both on the loan documents, the tax office can't point and say, well, what's going on here? Um, 
as far as if it's going to be owned in individual names, yes, but the 99 one means that your tenants in common, mm -hmm. not joint owners. Mm -hmm. And that also gives you the advantage we just talked about, but also means that that asset will go to the will. It won't automatically go to the spouse. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, the last one I want to chat to you about before we pivot off to our listener questions, Julia, is the pay-as-you-go tax variation or the income tax withholding variation, which is something that people can use for to help with their cash flow. But you, you've got a view on this that I, that I found interesting. So I'm, I'm keen to, to share that with our, with our community. Yeah, um, it's, it's virtually to get this, you have to do the tax return for that year and to estimate the value. And it's not that hard to do while you're doing the previous year's tax return. So that's the time to do it, not going separately and the account has to get their head around it all again. But all you're doing, you're not getting any more money for it. All you're doing is getting the money a little bit earlier because the tax office is going to tell your employer, well, they're going to get a $2,000 refund at the end of the year, so reduce their monthly pay by this little amount to make up for it. So it's not great. The interest rates are only 2%. So, again, not a huge amount of savings. And, um, it, you know, it's going to cost you money for your account to do it. Yeah. So, uh, when when I when I first bought my first property back in '99, just just for if everyone's listening to this and they're going, well, what are they talking about? It's basically um, what I use is a is a, a number. Uh, let's say you were due two thousand six hundred dollars tax refund, or even let's let's make it even simpler, five thousand two hundred dollars tax refund. What you can do is you can write to the tax department and say, hey, listen, I'm expecting a fifty two hundred dollar tax refund. So instead of waiting till the end of the year. Can you actually give it to me $100 for 52 weeks in my pay? They'll write a letter to your employer. They'll say, take $100 less out of their pay packet each week because you can give it to them now and it helps with cash flow during. Now, I did it back in 98. Interest rates were much higher. And uh, even when I was buying my first properties um, and helping clients back then, Julia, nearly every property we purchased was cash flow positive. So it kind of made sense. You get money, so it's cash flow positive, and it was part of the the I guess the paradigm at the time but what you're saying is you feel like it's got diminished um, assistance because well interest rates are so like part of the appeal was to get your money earlier so you could put it into your offset account so that you could be reducing the amount of interest that you're paying but you're saying now that it's negligible um, it may not provide that same advantage given that you may be paying premium on your accounting fees because the accountant has to pretty much do the prelim work and the tax work at the end of the year. Yeah, and you don't get your, your, year, your refund a year earlier. You just get it amortised over 12 months. So it's not like you're getting it all up front and saving a whole year's interest mm. or anything like that either. Mm. So there you go, folks. For those of you that are cash flow tight and it wouldn't make a difference week to week, well, it's available for you. But for the majority of, of folks, um, Julia is saying the, the, the benefit may not exist to the extent that it, uh, that it once did. So... There you go, folks. So hopefully that's helpful to lay a bit of a pathway. First of all, some information everyone needs to know about the deductibility of expenses. Then we've obviously gone through um, some of the common questions that we get asked here on the property couch and within our tax business as well. So let's move on now, Julia, to some of the questions that we have got from our community. This first one is from Tamika, um, and she has a question regarding capital gains tax on knockdown rebuild. Hi there, Property Couch. I've been loving your podcasts. I'm enjoying them. I've been listening for over 12 months since I found them. I've been looking forward every Thursday to the little message saying that they're um, uploaded. I've got a question. It's in regard to capital gains tax um, and knockdown rebuild. I don't know what sort of information I need to keep and whether evaluation prior to a demolishment is necessary, all of that sort of information. If you could please um, help with this, I'm thinking your tax agent, Julia Hartman, might have the best sort of information and advice in this situation. Yeah, planning to demolish a property that I've held for over 15 years. It's been a rental income um, since DOT, and obviously it was a lot cheaper, the land value and the house, and I, just want to get this right. So if you could give me some advice, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks. 
There you go, Julia. That question's from Tamika around um, CGT on knockdown. I think there's a there's a few ways that I'd love for you to tackle this. The first one is what happens if you knock down and rebuild a PPR and turn it into a PPR? Then what if you knock down a PPR and turn it into an investment? And then the third one is what do you what if you knock down an investment and turn it into a PPR? So should we kick it off with a PPR into a new PPR? Right. Okay. Now it used to be rather unnerving. The ATO had a ruling out that virtually said you demolish that house, the initial house, you lose your main residence exemption on it, gone. Yeah. And they had all sorts of hoops you had to dance through to um, build a bridge between the two houses. But they've withdrawn that ruling. They haven't replaced it, they just say. Um, and that ruling was the only thing we felt as a profession was in the way of being able to use Section 118150, which is about renovating houses. Yeah. So basically, um, as long as you... this Section 118150 requires her, if she's moving back, if she's demolishing her main residence and then going to live in the new house, she must move straight back into the new house as soon as the occupation is possible, the you know, certificate of occupation. She must cover it with her main residence for exemption for at least three months. And in the gap between demolishing the old house and moving into the new house must be no more than four years, and she can't cover another place with her main residence exemption during that time. Uh, if she dots all those, uh, dots all those I's and crosses all those T's, she can continue to cover the old house with the main residence exemption, the new house with the main residence exemption, and she ever sells it, no capital gains tax. Mm, okay, that's, uh, that's interesting because I'm about to do that, so that's a relief, um, and I will, be, I will be moving in straight away. Um, the second one, which relates, um, well, actually not relates to, the second one is a PPR that you're knocking down and rebuild and turning it into, say, two side-by-side -side townhouses that are going to become investment properties. What should people consider with that? So they're both going to be investment properties. That's an interesting twist. Yeah. 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 So you, well, what, you, what, what about what about if what about if it, it is one or the other? One's going to be they're going to live in and one they're going to rent out. That's that's probably a good scenario to, to talk through. Well, if they're going to live in one side, they could use what I just described. Yep to cover that property. But if they kept both of them as an investment property afterwards, well, then you've demolished the main residence and the main residence exemption attaches to a dwelling. Mm -hmm. It cannot be attached to the land. So once generally, if you demolish the main residence, you destroy the main residence exemption dating back 30, 40 years. Well, mm -hmm. that was pre 85, but you know. Um, so you, you destroy any main residence exemption you had. It's only that you could say, well, I'm using this section to rebuild and I move in and I dot all my I's and cross my T's. And that's what you get if they moved into one side of it. So they really do need to do that, at least on one side for three months, don't they? Absolutely. And then at least they've built that bridge and they can come back to that period of time, at least having their main residence exemption on it. Yep, good clarity there and then then the third one is obviously uh, the source of Tamika's question here an, an investment property that then becomes a um, a principal place of residence um, because she's had it as an investment property for over 15 years um, what, what about that one what, what, what needs to be thought of there do devaluations need to be ordered now there's no uh, benefit of evaluation there because she's um, doesn't get any reset doesn't get to quarantine the capital gain. It's like we were talking about earlier, where yep. it's apportioned over the whole time, number of days covered. Yep. Never going to get rid of that sleeping capital gains tax liability. Big box, keep lots of good records. Yeah. So, um, and uh, the demolishing costs, by the way, the demolishing costs do get to include in the cost base. Any costs do. You don't have to reduce the cost base because you demolish the old house. Yeah. The original price you paid stays in the cost space. Demolishing costs go in there. New build goes in there, the whole lot. Okay. All right. Well, um, this clearly, clearly to make it, you do need to, you do need to do a case by case on your particular circumstances and um, perhaps reaching out to, to us or Julie, we might be able to help you with that. But uh, good question to make it. It's, it's certainly give us uh, food for thought on, on a few things there. Um, I think the key takeaway from what you've just described there, Julia, is, that the principal place 
um, exemption exists to the building, not to the land. And I think if people can take that away as a guiding principle when they're overlaying any decisions, I think that might give them sort of a guiding light or a work towards to make sure that they, um, first of all, get advice, but two, um, if they're trying to work out in their head uh, what might be the right thing, that, that could be that good guiding principle for them. And maybe to also realise the only time you're going to get a reset to market value to mess about with your capital gains tax calculation, if it was covered by your main residence exemption the whole time until it was first used to produce income, or you die there and your heirs inherit it. Otherwise, you don't get it. You've got this whole pro rata calculation. There's no mystique about it. Mm. All right, good tip. Thank you. Next question is from Leonard. And this is a question about deductibility of interest. And let's be honest, we get lots and lots of questions about deductibility of interest. So I think this one will be helpful for a lot of people. Let's listen to the question from Leonard now. Hello, everyone. I've got a question for Julia. I took on a new loan by extracting some equity from an investment property that increased in value. Will the interest on this new loan be tax deductible if it is used for one or both of the following? Renovating the investment property or paying the monthly interest expense of the investment property loan? Thank you. There you go. Good question from Leonard. We get it a lot, Julia. Deductibility of interest. Um, how can you help here? Right. Well, we've got these new rules now that push not going to get a deduction uh, for interest when the property's not earning income. But yes, if um, you borrow to improve an investment property, then that borrowing is going to be deduct. The interest on that borrowing is going to start to become deductible once you you're um, it's producing rent. Now. Part of the borrowings is to make the interest repayments on the loan while you're not being able to earn rent, I gather, mm. called capitalising interest. Capitalising interest, <laughs> yes. Everyone wants to know yeah. if they can do it. Well, the tax office um, like to say, no, 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 capitalising interest is not. But there are cases that say that whatever the capitalised interest was doing, the, the, the interest on the new loan is treated the same. So... No, capitalised interest is all right. The tax office throw part 4A at it and say, well, the dominant purpose of doing that was to get a tax deduction, so it's void. Yeah. They're not going to allow you that interest deduction. Now, obviously, if he's not earning rent and he's doing the reno, he can't afford to make the interest free payments on the loan during that time, so he's capitalising them in the loan. It's not a dominant purpose of a tax deduction. In fact, the dominant purpose is to improve the rent from the property in the end. So he should be all right. And for him to stay afloat cash flow wise. Yeah. <laughs> During the yeah. Um, yeah, very good. I, I, I think I think the key takeaway for deductibility of interest in my experience is just um, always be thinking about the purpose of the loan, not the security. Because quite often most people are, are thinking about the security. Well, I've, in, I, I've got this loan for X, that's secured against an investment property. It's like, so therefore, isn't it deductible? No, just because it's secured against an investment property. I want to know what the X is over here. Because if that X is for a jet ski for your weekend recreation, no. But if that is for some shares or some form of income producing purpose, um, generally speaking, that is what the ATO is going to be looking at the deductibility of the interest for, what the X is over here, not what the security is. And I would say oh, four out of every five questions that we get on this topic, Julia, absolutely relate to confusion around collateral or security versus the dominant purpose of why they've got the loan. So um, what about claiming interest so um, I'm buying an investment property or someone's listening to this and they're buying uh, they bought up some land and they want to build it and when they build it they're going to rent it out and it's going to become an investment property what about the interest during the build phase the intention is for it to be available for rent clearly during the building phase you can't rent it but the whole intention through the stepped loan process is to get to that point what about the deductibility of interest for that because a lot of our listeners will fall into that category yeah, no, they changed the law recently for the mums and dads, not the big end of town, <laughs> that you can't get the, the interest as a tax deduction during the construction phase. The certificate of completion must be issued and it must be genuinely available for rent before you can start claiming the interest. But, of course, you could do what your previous um, follower said, 
that you could, if you can't afford the interest, you could capitalise that into the loan. You won't get a deduction for it. Mm. You will get to include it in your cost base. And then the interest on the interest, once you've rented the property out, would be deductible. There you go. All right. Something for you all to consider. Good question, Leonard. We appreciate you sending that in. So um, we've covered a bit of ground today, Julia. We've covered the basics. We've covered a few of the commonly asked questions um, that we get to see time and time again. We've covered some questions from some of our listeners as well, and they'll actually get a access to our start and build course just for, for um, contributing to our show today. So if they reach out to us, uh, info at thepropertycouch.com.au or via our socials, we'll make sure that you get free access to that, uh, both you, Leonard, and Tamika. Now, as we round out this conversation, Julia, you've got a checklist of do's and don'ts um, that property investors should be thinking about. Um, and the first one is to pay off non-deductible debt as soon as possible. But if it is a home, you may one day rent it out. So use an off offset account rather than directly pay the loan. We covered that in a couple of the previous questions. The second one you hear, you said use, use, only use a line of credit with the credit card used for private purposes on a non-deductible loan. Because if other loans for rental properties are lines of credit, only draw on them for rental property expenses and make sure these expenses are paid direct, not mixed with the private check account or the credit card used for private purposes. That's that's to do with pollution of loans isn't it? to to make sure that they don't get themselves caught up. And, and you sort of laboured on that a fair bit. So hopefully that's landed for some people. Yes, that's polluting the loan. Polluting the loan. Um, the next one is if you do not have a main residence or are considering buying a new one and renting out the, the one you are in, do not use funds in the offset account to pay an income producing or future income producing property expenses. That's important? Yes, because you want to borrow to pay those expenses to bring that loan up as much as you can because eventually the interest on that is going to be tax deductible. Yeah, so an another good tip there. Uh, the next one you've got for a deductible loan and offset arrangement is far better than a line of credit as it leaves the funds available for private purposes. We've covered that, which is great. Um, the next one is if the investment, this is a good one. Um, if the investment property will be held in the name of only one member of a couple, then ideally the borrowing should be in their name only. Try to persuade the bank to uh, try to persuade the bank to just accept the other spouse as a guarantor. Um, if the bank won't accept this, put a loan agreement in place by the spouses. Why is that important for you, Julia? Well, there's no really tangible, it's a general agreement that the tax office doesn't use it, but I have seen it used as sort of a negotiating tool that they'll say, well, half that interest isn't tax deductible because half of it was borrowed by your wife and the rental property is only in your name. So it's just good housekeeping to download it off the web somewhere, a loan agreement, where the, the non-owner spouse on lends their half of the loan to the, the um, owner spouse. And then the interest rate is exactly the same as what it is, so it cancels itself out. But you've got that on lending agreement. Good tip. And then the last one here you've got is don't... Um, one, of, one of the techniques that some people do is they, they pay interest uh, in June. They pay the, the, the following year's interest in advance. Um, so they have... So they have it as a tax deduction. Um, why do you say don't don't pay more than twelve months in advance? If you go over twelve months expenses, then they have to be amortised over the time of months in advance. You just have to go right. Well, I'd only I'd only paid a month's worth of interest, and I have to save the other twelve months for next year. Ah, uh, gotcha. Very good. And it's really only a strategy that works. The first year you do it anyway, paying interest in advance, because from that point on, you always got to catch up, don't you? Because you've got to pay the next year in advance to make sure that you've got it in the current year. And so it's really just a one-off strategy. And then you're, you're paying catch up from there on, aren't you? Or a useful strategy before you go on maternity leave or before you go overseas ah. on holiday or stuff like that. That's when I, or before you make it, when you make a capital gain, sorry. So you, yeah, you save it, you keep it in your back pocket. All right, that's a good uh, good tip. So there you go, folks. So hopefully that's been a benefit. Julia, you're obviously uh, uh, a wealth of knowledge. We've had a couple of other episodes with you where we've gone into intricate detail on a whole range of topics. So we're going to put some links into the show notes so that people can circle back and listen to those that we did with you previously, which has got some really high quality content in it. But uh, I just uh, appreciate you you sharing your wisdom because not only are we in, are we in, in tax season, but um, clearly 
there was a seat vacant here on the property couch for you to come and join me, which has been fantastic. And look, we, we rarely do this, uh, Ben and I, but uh, I just want to do a little uh, notification or reach out to let Empower Wealth clients know that we do now have a property tax division um, of Empower Wealth, where we've got a property savvy tax accountant who is preparing tax returns to maximise the amount of deductions that you are legally entitled to claim. So if you are an Empower Wealth client, we will have reached out to you recently, uh, most notably via email. So all you need to do is respond to that email and we will uh, prioritise helping you with your tax return. If you're not uh, one of our clients, just letting our community know that if you're interested in talking to us, um, you go to www.thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash tax. You can register your interest there. Um, and we, during this tax season, we are busy helping Empower Wealth clients. But if you would like us to fit you in, in uh, where we do have opportunities to take limited uh, appointments, we would love to hear from you. So just go to that uh, URL, thepropertycatch.com.au forward slash tax, leave your details there. And if you are an Empower Wealth client, you could also go there. There's a little checkbox there for you to let us know um, that you'd like us to chat. So there you go, folks. We are we are dedicated to helping um, our own clients, our community maximise the amount of deductions that they are legally entitled to get. And we're very, very excited as a business um, to have this as part of the suite of services that we can provide to help people with their financial transformation. So my life hack today is Julia. Um, it's around getting tax advice, um, particularly when you become a property investor. Some people actually do their own tax returns when it's just their own things, uh, pay as you go, standard deductions. But when they actually get an investment property, there is an extra layer of complexity that comes. But you also want to maximise the amount of deductions that you're allowed to have. Get the money back from the ATO that you really should be entitled to. So if you do not have a tax agent, I just want to recommend that you should as a property investor so that you can maximise that. So Bantax is obviously a group we at Empower Wealth as someone that can help, but it's important uh, as a property investor that you treat it like a business, that you get the maximum that you can get back from it. Um, so my life hack today is if you are a property investor, consider getting a specialist to help you rather than doing it yourself um, because it's really important. A, you don't get it wrong, but B, you maximise what you got. So that's my life hack today, Julia. And um, what I don't normally do at this point is what's making property news. I usually throw it over to Ben, um, but Julia, he's not here today. So I am going to be doing it in his absence and take over instead. But um, I have found an article where House in Abbotsford went uh, $650,000 over reserve. Uh, it was an inner west brick house uh, renovated um, with renovated interiors, sold at auction for $1.4 million more than what it was purchased for two years ago. Julia, $1.4 million in two years, which was uh, $650,000 over reserve. That's not bad, is it? Yeah, it's not. <laughs> hey, it's been a pleasure, Julia. I have loved every minute of it. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience. I think our audience will get enormous benefit out of that. And, um, I'd certainly encourage anyone who wants to reach out to Julia to, to get the details within our show notes. And um, Julia, hopefully we can have you on uh, again once that new book comes out. How does that sound? Oh, yes. Um, maybe before that too. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So there you go, folks. But because uh, Ben's not here, I'm going to let you know that uh, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. See you next week, folks. Hey there, folks, Bryce here again, just letting you know that since I recorded this episode with Julia a little earlier uh, in the week, we have had a major announcement when it comes to negative gearing, where the Australian Labor Party on Monday, the 26th of July, the federal opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, confirmed that the Labor government would maintain existing regimes for negative gearing and capital gains tax. So what does that mean? They've effectively publicly declared that when the next election rolls around, they will not be taking the policy that they took to 2016 election and the 2019 election where they wanted to make changes to negative gearing for on existing properties and the capital gains tax regime. Those are no longer policies that, they, that the Australian Labor Party wants to take to the next election. So this is important for most property investors. That is a welcome relief because the idea that there was going to be some significant savings around that, uh, we always felt 
was 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 not based on a lot of uh, fact. But the important thing here is uh, that it's kind of an acknowledgement that it's not just rich fat cats that are using the negative gearing policy to uh, buy more properties. It's generally uh, people who are aspirational, trying to get ahead and using negative gearing for a short term whilst they get it to positive cash flow as quickly as possible so that then can create positive um, positive wealth effect for the family. Now, Ben and I have talked about this at length uh, in previous episodes during the recent or the most recent uh, election debate. So if you want to find out any more details around the reasons why, um, you can go and check out those episodes. And when Ben and I get together uh, to record our next podcast, we will definitely be talking about this significant news. But uh, it's important that uh, for those of you that weren't across it, that uh, the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, has confirmed that there will be no changes to negative gearing on existing properties and capital gains tax for the next election campaign. So there you have it, folks. Important that you need to know that, digest that. Ben and I will definitely unpack that in more detail when we get together on the next podcast that we do. Hey there, folks, Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and only listen to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now, for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the A, B, C, D, and so much more. And you can get that straight away. If you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20, you can download it and consume it whenever you want. It's completely free and available now. And for those of you, just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice. We recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information. Now don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.